recording. Thanks for having me. Sort of a gloomy day. Can you hear me? Other people who are supposed to be hearing me can hear me. Awesome. Well, um, we'll kick off. So titling gets to be a problem with this because we're talking about burnout, or we're talking about wellness, we're talking about joy and medicine. Um, and so burnout sounds kind of negative. Wellness sounds pretty good. Joy in medicine, I'm pretty sure my grandfather would not approve of having joy at work. That's why they pay you. So I went with wellness. Um, no frogs were harmed in the making of this talk, but I, the subtitle is how to boil a frog. So if I had woken up one day five years ago and felt like I feel right now, I would have known something was very wrong with me. And um, this is a homage to the story about how if you put a frog into a pot of boiling water, it'll jump out. But if you put a frog into like rice style rather than pasta style, so put the frog in and warm it up slowly that the frog will adapt to the temperature change. And it's not quite a boiling, a roiling boil in medicine, but it's getting, getting steamy. I have no disclosures unfortunately. <laughs> Presumably that means I'm doing something good. But um, So I, what I want to impart today, and we can uh, wander around topics as you wish, but at least get an um, understanding of the current definition and models of burnout. Um, we're actually going to measure burnout today, which will give you an excuse to handle your cell phone. Um, and then construct some basic points of action based on data. So hopefully this won't feel like 5 million leg lifts in hell. So what is burnout? Well, you kind of know it when you see it. Um, for the purposes of um, research, instruments um, are designed to help us evaluate it. But basically, um, the big thing is emotional exhaustion. You know what I'm talking about. Um, depersonalization uh, and low personal accomplishment. This sounds familiar, I take it. Okay. So this triad of things um, leads to um, a diagnosis of burnout, and it's now in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. So this has been a hot topic now for the last several years. And... Um, it's very prevalent depending on how you, what instrument you use to measure it, up to half of the providers have some, some symptoms of burn, burnout. So, um, and it's getting worse. So who cares? <laughs> well, <laughs> so there's professional and personal um, side effects that come up with this. And the, we'll go through the professional side because I think um, that's important. There's good data that quality of care is impacted, um, patient satisfaction is impacted, as well as adherence to medication. Um, there is a definite uh, trend for decreased productivity and more importantly, uh, clinical effort. So people start cropping their FTE clinically. And then physician turnout, which turnover, which has some big implications financially. So th these are the professional, some of the professional um, outfall that we have um, good data for. On the personal side, you know, broken relationships and then obviously alcohol and other substance use and abuse. Um, depression is a big um, part of this, and it can coexist with burnout or by itself, of course. And um, interestingly, when uh, students enroll into medical school, they actually have much better mental health than their peers do. And by the time they're done with medical school, they've caught up and exceeded, which is kind of a worrisome trend. Suicide is for real. There's about 400 physicians annually who um, commit suicide uh, nationwide. And that needle has not moved much. Um, male physicians have 40% higher 
um, suicide rates than their peers. And females actually have 130% um, the suicide rate as their peers. So it matters, and you know this. Um, so to, in order to try to quantify um, what it costs for turnover, much less F, uh, reduction in FTE, um, Shane Felt keeps updating this. Um, he was at Mayo and now is at Stanford, but they go through sensitivity analysis and somewhere between half a million and a million dollars um, to uh, replace a departing physician. And the narrative that, oh, we're in an ac academic place, we'll just hire the new guys, probably doesn't work out very well because um, it's very hard to replace a mid-career physician and that efficiency and judgment that's been gained. Um, as if you've ever had somebody leave your group and felt the burden as a remaining person to take on that extra work and figure out how to get it done, that can cause a lot of instability um, to groups. And then obviously reduced access to care, satisfaction, medication adherence, as we talked about, and then patient disenrollment. So this is a recent, like just from May, um, analysis on trying to attribute cost to physician burnout in the US. And um, again, this is sensitive to lots of assumptions, but if you just really focus on reduced FTE and loss of workforce. It's about $4.6 billion per year um, related to this, much less accounting for outcomes and quality of care and that kind of stuff. So it's a problem, we all agree. And so a lot of this you probably heard before, but so I'm here to tell you and convince you that burnout does not have to occur. Um, it's a long-term stress reaction. If you take nothing else from this talk, um, stress um, that's chronic can lead to burnout if, unless there's some interventions or mitigators. The predictors of stress are pretty clear. Um, you know, time pressure, control, um, support, chaos uh, at work, values alignment in the positive way. And so, um, so we know predictors uh, a great deal of them. So burnout is predictable and thus preventable. And so that's what we're going for. This is the most important slide, I think, in the deck. And it's just a model, a conceptual model that I groove on that um, was uh, cooked up many years ago in regards to uh, supply and demand. <laughs> So, so chronic stress um, can be an imbalance of demand and um, control and support. So um, over here, you have demands. You know what that is. See more patients, uh, work faster, work with less support, um, to get your mom in a nursing home, take care of your little kids, blah, blah, blah. And then on this other side, we have work control. Um, and then support, so help with facilitating um, efficient work and, um, and uh, emotional support and so on. So when these things are out of balance and the de demands are overcome by um, control and support is when we get stress. And stress is okay, but once stress is there for a long time, it becomes a problem. So, um, Mark, like Mark Linzer loves this slide. He cooked it up in 2001. And so um, I show it because we know, we know some things about background variables. For example, we know people in solo practice and academic practice um, have a higher rate of burnout. We know that the more um, consecutive days worked and the more night shifts worked um, causes a lot of job stress and can uh, lead to burnout. Gender, we'll come back to in a minute. Um, women are more, have a higher rate of burnout than men, but the men are catching up. Um, being coupled is protective. Having children can be a stressor. And then years worked is interesting. So you, you know, burnout can happen at any point, right? Medical school through your last day of work. Um, but generally um, in the early years of practice, um, 
you know, there's some protect, protection that's afforded by that. And it's really mid-career physicians that struggle with this at, a high, at the highest rate. The late career physicians um, seem not to, and I think that may be actually a survival bias. <laughs> so if you're late in your career and you're super unhappy, then you just leave. So there's these mediating variables, like we talked about, work control, work home um, support or interference. So people can ho tolerate uh, stress at work or stress at home, but once you put them together, it's synergistically not good. And then the outcomes are stress or satisfaction, hopefully satisfaction, and um, if the stress persists, burnout. So just one slide about gender. We know uh, some about this, and I see there's some women in the audience. We're good there. <laughs> Um, so we think that um, the 60% 60, 60 greater odds in women physicians versus men for um, burnout. Um, some of that is explained by, we think, gendered expectations for listening. So both men and women patients expect that their female doctor is going to listen to them, <laughs> which I don't know. Um, I, fe I felt this. Um, <laughs> women describe a faster pace and importantly less values alignment with um, leadership. And um, I p keep putting U.S. because this is different than the European um, des uh, description. So solutions will we'll come to towards the end of this talk, but you know collaboration on um, how to get the work done, flexibility, resources to be efficient and understanding and good communication to try to attain uh, alignment. So, um, so I'll just like put out there my bias right now and we can dispense with it. So um, there's a lot of wellness work uh, written about uh, resilience training and career fit and um, the like. And so yoga is awesome. You should do it. Mindfulness and such, very good. We are resilient people. That's how we got through training. That's how we work now. Um, and so the dialogue that the boat is sinking and the doctor should just bail harder is not a very useful one. And so um, for me, it's great to do individual resilience training, but when you talk about a workforce that may be 50% burned out, um, that's not gonna get us to where we wanna go. And so my own bias is that, yeah, you should do that stuff, but it's really about practice transformation to make this work. So launching into that. So I have to show Linzer's uh, Healthy Workplace Study. This is, uh, looks a little um, less than profound, but basically they ran uh, cluster randomized uh, clinic practices um, for either, and they ad, um, administered these types of interventions, kind of grouped as workflow, design, communication improvement, and then chronic disease quality improvement. So quality is one thing that we can really get behind. And you can kind of see the things that were done, but basically these, Types of interventions led to 17% reduction in burnout, so it's effective. Um, and furthermore, in his other study memo, um, uh, there were many fewer errors and uh, more confidence amongst the physicians that they're de uh, delivering quality of care. Going up a step higher, this was actually written uh, by a, the, one of the Mayo Clinic CEOs. Not sure if he's still there. Um, but uh, talking about organizational culture and how that can support wellness uh, amongst the clinicians. And so my ideas and suggestions are valued by my organization. My organization helps me deal with stress and burnout. If you, can in, if you have providers who endorse this, um, it's a good sign of organizational health. 
Um, I stuck these last two points in because I thought they're super poignant and not coming from a physician, but organiza organizational leaders must stop treating physicians like their employees and clinicians need to be part of the solution. Uh, tangenting ever so slightly. So trust in the organization is something that um, has been studied a bit more recently and not surprisingly, um, uh, having a practice emphasis on quality over productivity, values alignment with uh, clinical leaders, practice emphasis on communication, um, co collegiality or cohesion in the, your group and work control all contribute um, to phys physician trust in the organization. Sounds a little pie in the sky. All right. So this is the instrument that we use at Hennepin, changing gears, um, to uh, assess where people are at. We use the Mini-Z. Um, the probably the most widely used um, survey is actually the Maslach Burnout Inventory. It's 22 questions. Um, it is sort of established as the most gold standard thing that we have. Um, the problem is after the Maslach, you know that people are burned out, but you're not really sure why or what's actionable. And so Mark developed, Mark Linzer developed the Mini-Z. Um, and so the questions, the, it's a 10-question survey. It takes like two minutes to take. Um, the questions in the yellow are about workplace support. And the questions in the green are about work pace, um, including the dreaded electronic medical record. So hey, guess what? We're going to do the Mini-Z. So everybody grab your phone. And easiest just to open the web. So this thing right here. So just open a browser, polev.com. And then I put a space up here because it's just all this blah of L's and E's and stuff that's confusing. So this without a space, Michelle LeClaw. Um, we'll get you to the poll. Does anybody need this up longer? Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. Let me do one. Not caps. Let me just make sure that we're active. Yes, we are. So I'll go back. It's always a little touchy with technology. I'm gonna take a nap over there. Yeah, it's supposed to, I'm in control. Oh. <laughs> so, has everybody gotten in that wants to get in? Because it's okay if you give up. So overall, I'm satisfied with my current job. This is excellent. So let's see where we fall out. Close enough? So overall, um, this group and anybody who's remotely in has pretty high agreement with being satisfied with the job. <coughs> and some actually agree strongly. So this is a marker of good health, so to speak, in terms of your job satisfaction. So using your own definition of burnout, please select one of the numbers before. And you can see, I enjoy my work, I have no symptoms, I'm under stress. Don't always have as much energy, but I don't feel burned out. I'm beginning to burn out and have one or more symptoms of burnout. Symptoms of burnout I'm experiencing won't go away. But I feel completely burned out and I'm at the point where I may need to seek help. So E and D, if these things get, well, for sure E, if these things get answered by a participant at our place, the, um, we do a PHQ-2, Patient Health Questionnaire 2, 
basically asking if they've lost interest in doing things or, and if they've been down or depressed over the last two weeks. And if they, um, if they, if they do, we, the follow-up also is, may we contact you? And you, they can opt out or opt in. But we feel like screening for depression and suicidality is really important. Obviously, we're not doing the PHQ-2. because. <laughs> so this is um, pretty, pretty good. Um, most people uh, endorse you know, being under stress but don't feel burned out or starting to have some symptom of burnout. So that 38% is, you know, kind of correlates with um, what, what we're seeing at Hennepin as well. Uh, but overall is good. My professional values are well aligned with those of my clinical leaders. This is a person that leads your uh, clinical responsibilities. All right, so we have uh, some that agree strongly, some that agree, and then there's you know 24% or so who are neutral or disagree with that. This is one of those things that is protective. Um, and so when we see um, that drift towards more and more trouble with alignment, we, our feelers are up. Teamwork, so the degree to which my care team works efficiently. Yeah. One more. Okay, we're just gonna go with that. So it's a spread for you guys, and um, you probably think, think, well, which team? Is it my clinic team or my, co my colleagues or my uh, inpatient team or whatever? So this is a big spread. We know teamwork is protective. Um, so we'd like to see, obviously, more of the marginals move into the goods or optimals. So there's room there. My control of my workload is for marginal satisfactory good optimal. Okay, a third of marginal and satisfactory each. There's some goods and a bunch of pores. So, <laughs> so a spread again, and that, that actually doesn't surprise me based on the, um, what it is that you do. I mean, you take care of critically ill patients <laughs> and those who are super sick. And so um, control isn't necessarily the whole story at work, but it's part of it. I feel a great stress because of my job. Agree strongly, agree, neither dis agree or disagree, new, uh, disagree or strongly disagree. So for me, this is the most important question. Um, these, this group right here, and if there were any here, these are the folks who are um, likely, more likely to burn out in the next year or have more burnout symptoms in the next year. So it's that chronic stress that, I'm sorry, um, the agree, I got it upside down. I got it upside down, but it's the same number. So the, the <laughs> 36, oh my God, thanks. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> I would say something like that. <laughs> but we're doing wellness. <laughs> Uh, and so the, the folks who feel a great deal of stress are the ones at risk. By the time people have full-blown burnout, it's really more damage control and trying to reorient um, the whole work-life balance to um, make it work. The, it, um, so we look at units or departments that have lots of stress, even if they don't have a lot of burnout. So we don't want to wait till then. We want to pay attention to that. Sufficiency of time for documentation.
continue the scat scattergram. So we're all getting better at this thing, finding shortcuts. Um, sort of the signal is satisfactory or marginal, some are poor. Um, this kind of leads to the next question. The amount of time I spend on the EMR at home is... <laughs> Somebody got on their thing fast. Just two more questions. So, so interestingly, there's sort of, and we, we see this a lot actually. So there's a bunch of minimals or nuns, and then there's a bunch that are moderately high <laughs> or excessive. And um, it seems to, it seems to happen this way. It is a scattergram for sure. And for me, I, I never know what this means. Like, I guess it's your perception of whether it's excessive or um, at home or not. Like, I like to go home and then write my note, you know, my clinic notes, because at least I'm at home. <laughs> but other people, like, want to get it all done before. All right, EMR adds to frustration of my day. Okay, so this is non-value added work is one of the things that physicians say over and over or providers say over and over is a life sucker. And so when you have to do 50 clicks, it gets pretty, and you're in a hurry, it gets pretty bad. And then atmosphere in your primary um, work area, calm, busy, or totally chaotic. And some people, it's kind of crazy because um, when we like look at our emergency medicine physicians, they always say it's chaotic, and it is. But it doesn't necessarily make them super unhappy. Like to be going to clinic and taking care of toenail fungus and that kind of stuff would make them want to die inside. <laughs> but <laughs> exactly. So this, this looks good. You're busy, um, but it's reasonable. Some are edging towards being more busy than you should be. And so um, these are sort of made-up targets that we look at. Um, we'd like 80% satisfied, less than 20% burned out, and that would be the bottom two. A lot, better alignment, good teamwork, um, reasonable control. Um, Certainly less than 30% stressed. Um, and then, so we'll go back quick. So, um, so the bar that's on the agree would be a, a point of concern. Um, values alignment is decent, um, but it probably has room for improvement. Um, nobody's um, in the D or E category, but the C um, is somewhat worrisome. And job satisfaction is, is good. So anybody else see signals that you want to point out? That's what I thought. <laughs> All right. I wonder if there's a selection bias of the people that come to a Monday 7 a.m. lecture. <laughs> <laughs> the people that uh, are not so emotionally exhausted that they cannot tolerate it. Yeah. yeah. Right? So I think if anything, these are probably optimistic relative yeah. to the whole. Yep. I agree. And, you know, we go back and forth on this because we're pretty stoked if we can get 70% response. Um, to our annual wellness survey. And so, um, you know, it is what it is. Even if it's an uh, underestimate of um, burnout, it's, for, you know, something to pay attention to. So I'm going to show you, actually, I'll come back to that if I have time. So top, top secret. Um, here's the 2018 snapshot from, this is what all employee, uh, all the providers get. 
Um, so satisfaction is good, but 56% are stressed out. Um, half don't have very good control over their workload. 80% have decent values alignment, which is um, positive, and um, teamwork is quite positive as well. But yet 41% are burned out. And we've seen this creep up despite the work that we do um, in this realm. And so, um, so it's something we're paying a lot of attention to um, for many reasons. Uh, along with our mini Z, we get there's one question um, that's open ended, and uh, this has been recurring now for a while. But uh, we're not flush with cash, so there's concern for insufficient staffing. Um, there's a lot of um, imbalance between what employees or what physician providers feel um, is productivity versus the mission. We're very mission oriented. Um, a lot of work away from work. And then almost always there's some comment of appreciation for the opportunity to do this. Another response bias. <laughs> and so what happens is, you know, this, all this data gets rolled up to, because uh, we're a departmental kind of place. Um, gets rolled up to the departmental chiefs. So medicine gets all rolled into one and surgery and ob gyn and that kind of stuff. And um, the us, uh, the five of us at the Office of Professional Work Life actually go and meet with the chiefs with their data and say, here's what, here's what we see. Um, here is where you were last year and the year before. And so we can look at trends, we can look at bright spots, and we can look at problems that need to be dealt with. And you might argue, well, if you do that once a year, it's <laughs> horse may be out of the barn. Um, and so we're trying actually to move into more of a real-time assessment um, that's app-based and um, kind of a gamified experience. And so we'll see what comes of that. But this will persist. So I want to talk a little bit before I turn it over to questions about the ICU data I have. So this will be the first year actually where um, one of the demographic questions will be, you know, do you work in an ICU here? And if so, which one? And, but in 2017, I actually um, surveyed uh, the critical care people because Sick, you know, sick you and burn live under surgery department that gets rolled up into that. The MICU lives under the medicine department gets rolled into that. The pediatric ICU gets rolled into peds. So it's all siloed. And so um, because of that silo, I sought to try to understand what was going on with our critical care um, providers. And so it's a small number. We got 21 um, providers in the ICU, that's a 70% response rate, which isn't too bad, versus other Hennepin health systems providers. And so of note, um, burnout was lower in the ICU providers versus all comers. Um, there's actually um, good teamwork, values alignment, and satisfaction um, in the ICU providers. And in fact, odds of burnout were four times lower when we looked at multivariate analysis. Um, and values alignment was protective. Um, so three times less burnout in, um, versus all providers. Um, I added in a question about non-beneficial care because I, as a critical care provider, I feel like that causes a lot of moral distress amongst our providers. Interestingly, our um, CICU colleagues really didn't feel that burden. Um, as much as the, again, small sample, as much as the medical ICU physicians. And then we went around and um, collected qualitative data. And so one of the themes that kind of bubbled to the top was not, none of our critical care for pr providers did just critical care. They did critical care in anesthesia, they did critical care in trauma surgery, they did critical care in pulmonary, so on and so forth. Um, and so that, that was one of the things narrated as being protective. Here's another thing that's narrated as being protective. So this is our provider 
wellness and dining center. <laughs> and these things are going by the wayside as we've all become really busy. But um, the surgeons and the medical intensive doc, uh, care unit doctors tend to sit at these tables and have lunch. And not every day, but um, it's a place for um, community um, to talk about your difficult cases, debrief things that are stressful at work or home. And um, that, that um, community and um, connectedness, I think, really makes a big difference. Our offices are cohorted, surgeons and ICU doctors, or MICU doctors. And so um, there's always sort of this background of, um, like, we, we don't have as much opportunity to isolate ourselves. And then uh, on the other side is our workout room. So um, the, if uh, it wasn't totally clear, when we, when we look at the wellness data, we want to look at places, the departments that are in trouble and respond to them, losing an orthopedist and who does hips all day, who's, you know, tired and doesn't, you know, um, is thinking about leaving is a huge expenditure for our place, right? Um, so we pay attention to those types of things, and then we also pay attention to bright spots. So the ICUs, we'll see if it holds up this year, um, have been bright spots um, for some made-up stories. <laughs> so we'll go back to this. So this is a super busy slide, but... So the... Uh, Office of Professional Work Life was established when Mark Linzer came to Hennepin in 2015. Um, uh, the substrate was constructed um, based on the Provider Wellness Committee, which is um, the folks who help work on um, department-specific burnout reduction activities. Um, there's the Wellness Center I talked about. Um, EMR stress reduction intervention, so at the elbow training, um, template management, those types of things. And then um, there's a tiny reset room where you can just go by yourself and have your thoughts. And then um, depending on the needs of the department, maybe uh, uh, at times there's been retreats. Um, every department has a wellness champion. Um, we've just recently um, appointed a chief wellness officer. Um, we have burnout on the organizational dashboard now. We'd very much like to tie incentives to, uh, to burnout. And then um, for distressed providers, there's individual and um, counseling or coaching that can be offered. So that's, that's kind of what we're doing there. So we take it, you know, based on individual, based on division or department as we need to. Well, what else do I have here? Uh, I'll give a couple examples of how this has been um, operationalized. So uh, we lost a couple primary care providers. Um, and, and uh, some had expressed uh, stress and um, some symptoms of burnout. And so the, as, uh, as we sort of drilled into it, what we found is that in this particular primary care setting, um, the, the uh, last appointment of the day, which was at 4.30, um, was a complex follow-up. And the nurses left at 5. And so the... Uh, provider who's trying to get home and pick up their kids or whatever is um, was oftentimes stuck there with a complex patient who may or may not have needed to be admitted and there's like the whole clinic had cleared out and it made them completely frustrated and angry uh, uh, which you know probably doesn't surprise you and so um it was, uh, they, they sort of did a, you know, lean event around figuring out how, why this happened and how, how to, like, enact some tests of change, but it was actually fairly simple in that they just moved the really complex follow-up to the front end of the afternoon session, and um, 
and then left the you know more straightforward as they at least as much as they could estimate towards the end and um, that actually uh, worked well burnout uh, got cut in half in that particular clinic and the uh, bleeding stopped in terms of losing providers and the pa the providers still saw the same number of patients so there wasn't a loss in productivity these aren't things that cost a lot of money um, but they work um, one, uh, one last example is um, a high-performing uh, department. This is a few years ago, quite a few years ago. Had high stress and burnout, so um, the problem was the leadership felt like we, they needed to have more throughput and volume. And um, as they drilled into it, EMR work was really the biggest issue. And so this was the uh, time that we tested scribes, pilot, piloted scribes, it was fabulous success, and, um, and it still, that program still exists. This really reduced burnout dramatically. So those are a couple examples, I guess. There's been ones that go better and ones that don't go quite but as well, um, but there you go. So, I don't know if you can see this. Uh, Doreen breezes through chapter nine of equine medicine, everything equals shoot. <laughs> I, would, <laughs> I would say there's no magic bullet. Um, sometimes um, part-time work or flex, more flexible work, um, leaders actually um, walk the walk of wellness, um, promoting work control, um, trying to alter our, what, I love this, culture of endurance. We learn just to keep trudging ahead and then by the time you figure out that you can't trudge ahead any further, it's too late. And then um, just a basic wellness focus and community. <clears throat> so with that, I will stop and we can entertain some questions. Michelle, great talk. Thanks, uh, thanks for coming, and it's great to see our, our own data. Um, so, you know, I mean, you guys have you know uh, a group that works on it. With how should how should we uh, take that data? What are the next steps? Yeah, I think the big thing is you have to measure in order to figure out what ne what you need to do, um, and then and even as it is, there's certainly room for improvement and you saw some of those signals and so being thoughtful as a group and you're a big group but you're your group and so <coughs> thinking about the places where you can start to move, bend the curve a little bit um, and I'm happy to chat with you guys about that but I think it would be that's the way that I would go with that it'd be helpful to have a champion to sort of help drive that work in your group. Doesn't mean you have to dedicate a ton of time to it, but measure and get somebody to drive the work. I'm just curious how, to, how primary care physicians compare to specialty physicians? In terms of burnout? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these are all like Medscape type, um, type surveys. Um, primary care actually has a really high um, burnout rate. I mean, considering there's nobody that has 20% and there's nobody who has 70%, but emergency medicine, primary care, critical care um, have high, higher, little higher rates of, um, of burnout than ophthalmology, for example. <laughs> I hope there's no ophthalmologists here judging me. <laughs> 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 no, just saying. <laughs> Yes. For how long we've been collecting data or even looking at this, is there some sort of generational component? So you have like the baby boomers, the generation X, and is that why they're so more relaxed? They went through the Great Depression and, you know, there's different things. Yeah. Well, I'm, I, I mean, when I was a medical student, we certainly didn't crab about working hard. And the work life balance is different. And I, you know, that's often asked. Um, about the you know sense of what 
work is and how it should be. Um, but there's also this phenomenon of now we can talk about it. People are starting to talk about it and we have awareness now because you just, you know, people just stuffed it deep down inside, got their alcoholism rolling and divorced and so on and so forth. And so, <laughs> so it's hard to say. But it's an interesting uh, phenomenon. Any else? Thank you so much again. Thank you.